Good morning, Faith Life Church Northwest. Let's stand and, and thank the Lord for what he's about to do. Lord, we do with anticipation, with anticipation and joy and excitement. We look to you this morning for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, for your presence, for your word to come forth powerfully, mm -hmm. for your miraculous to be in demonstration, for you to confirm your word with signs and wonders, for your people to be refreshed, for your people to be given uh, revelation knowledge that they can walk in and the grace of God that they might do it. And Lord, we thank you that you are so very good all the time. It's because of you that we live, that we move, that we have our being, that we have eternal life, that our sins are forgiven. It's because of you that we can face tomorrow. It's because of you that we walk into mm -hmm. a new year saying this shall be the best one yet. It's because of you that we know that we have a firm foundation underneath us, that we are hidden in the cleft of the rock, that we can live in the secret place, that we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb yes. and by the word of our testimony. Lord, it's because of you and your promises which are yes and amen it's because lord you cannot fail will not fail and you will for all to be saved and all to be healed and for all to receive of the good gifts of god and so lord we thank you that that is real to us real to us and we will not accept anything else for we shall believe the report of the lord so have your way this day let us leave completely changed from glory to glory love Provider. In you there is freedom. In you there is everything we have need of this morning. And Lord, we believe that the anointing and the grace of God and the revelation of your word makes that so real to your people that we just reach out and grab whatever we have a need for. Whatever we have, it's available. It's available in that realm. Get us in a place, oh God, that we just reach out and say it's mine and it's mine now. And I know it, not going through a religious motion, not trying to do something, not trying to get myself in that place, but I just know it, that he's true. Let God be true and every man a liar. And I reach out and take it. So Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen and amen, amen. Aren't you glad he's true and he's good all the time? All the time. Hallelujah. You may be seated if you want. All the time. Not part of the time. All the time. He's good. You know, I was thinking, Jennifer, as we were singing that song, There is Freedom. I've always loved that song. That needs to go all over the world. Somehow that needs to go all over the world. And I was just thinking, I think we need to get a copy of it with your voice recorded singing it. And send it to, because I know several good churches that, that have their own music that goes all over the world. And um, I think we just need to get it some places because it, just the song in and of itself helps you to see there is freedom, there is joy, there is all of those things. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There are some songs that are just birthed in the throne room and that's one of them. In fact, as I was contemplating it, the Lord brought something else back to me and in the early days of revival in Alaska, I sat down and wrote many songs and actually recorded them before my voice got so raspy. And uh, I thought they were all gone, and I found a copy a while back going through things. And uh, I need to resurrect some of those songs because they were given to me in the heart of revival, and uh, including that one I asked for fresh oil from heaven once again, which is the one that the Lord rained down on me in when I was singing it and began the revival that, that we took into 35 nations so we need to re resurrect them and if i'm too hoarse to sing them these days i'll get jennifer or someone to sing some of them and um because those things that god gives when you aren't just sitting down to go okay let's see if i can get a song but he just drops them in you they're from the throne room and they are to change lives and uh hallelujah this morning um I made a list of announcements because we have several. First of all, I want to thank Gary and Charlotte and 
and Chava and Jackie Olson and and Brianne and am I missing anyone? Uh, oh yeah. Oh, help me again with your name. It's Aurelia. Uh, yes, Aurelia. Aurelia. And I want to thank Aurelia as well for coming yesterday and not only taking all these decorations down, but they went up and cleaned up the attic and made room for storage and put storage units together. And and that was a lot of work all afternoon, and I'm so thankful. So thank you, everyone. It takes that kind of... I'm believing for the day we have enough people that everything doesn't fall on just a few. And uh, that day is coming. But until then, I'm so thankful for people that will change hats and do everything that needs to be done. want to remind you the exciting announcement that we've been talking about for a few weeks. It actually begins tonight. Sunday night services are back. <laughs> and uh, hallelujah. And I'm trusting that the church is a part of that. I'm, I, you know, I had a tendency. I had said earlier when we talked about this, I don't care what other churches do. I'm doing it at 7 o'clock. You know, when I was growing up and we aren't by the way we're doing it at six but i'm just going to explain in a moment when i was growing up sunday night services everywhere were at seven and then all of a sudden one or two churches started changing it to six or six thirty and it spread like wildfire and everybody said well that's because people have to get up on mondays and stuff and i said well don't they have to on wednesdays get up on thursdays and <laughs> and when we have revival all week don't they have to get up those days i never understood and, and when I go to churches that, of course, as the evangelist, I'm like, oh, there's six o'clock one. I'm just going to get done and have to turn around and be back in there. And I was always thankful for the ones that started at seven. So I said, when we go back, I'm starting at seven. But guess what? I caved into the desires around me of, of people saying, well, for those who get up early. And so it's just going to be kind of quick for the preacher who has to have another message ready and be ready to preach again in a few hours. But I want us to be able to take our time and I want people to be able to not worry so much about getting that extra hour of sleep. So uh, we're going to go with six o'clock Sunday evenings. And so I'm looking forward to that. Sunday nights historically have been, uh, they have been what are, are called the evangelistic outreach services. And they've been the services where people feel they can take more time in the Holy Ghost and that people aren't ready to get out and have lunch on Sundays. And so and I just, I always feel like we can't get enough in the week. We have declared that Wednesday nights are our Bible school, and that it is. And you're getting entire courses that people have to give up their lives and go to Bible school for. However, that doesn't leave lots of times for powerful Holy Ghost meetings. So that's what I'm believing on Sunday nights. And uh, I'm believing that in time, it gives a lot more of our, our people who are called to ministry here opportunity to share from time to time as well. So um, we have, how many know we started a series months ago that I stayed on pretty good for the first couple of months? And then I felt like the Lord started having us do one or two special meetings uh, where I got off the subject of the anointing. And then, but I feel to finish that up now, we just have a few of them left. And since we're really going into the year and I'm believing for such an increase in the anointing of the Holy Ghost, I want us to be aware of that, know how to yield in it, all of those things. So I believe we'll continue to the, the subject this morning and tonight. And tonight, unless the Holy Ghost goes in a different direction, I believe we're going to talk about special healing anointings, special corporate anointings in believers kinds of meetings, things that I want to expect here in Sunday night services where believers just get a word from the Lord, especially while we're the smaller size. Uh, I'm believing for some very special things to happen. So you want to be here and hear about that tonight. By the way, we didn't, <laughs> I had to laugh that Wednesday night we ran out of time to do half the things I had hoped we could, should do. We, we should have left it at seven and just gone from seven to midnight. But if anyone prepared or had something on your heart for a special testimony for the old year going out and the new year coming in, I'm still going to give opportunity for that tonight. So any of you that have, have something on your heart, uh, get ready for that tonight. Get the word out too about Sunday night meetings because there are some other churches that don't have Sunday nights anymore. And I think I've heard from a lot of people that, oh, I miss Sunday night meetings. And I think there are people from other places that would just like an extra service and be blessed and it would bless us to have them. So get the word out. Uh, Wednesday night, seven o'clock, Christ the Healer. 
No prayer this Thursday night, even though normally we have prayer the first Thursday of the month. But we said since we closed out the year in prayer and welcomed the new one in in prayer, that that would be this month's meeting. So this Thursday night, we're not going to be doing it. Um, I, wanna, I haven't said a whole lot about this. I've mentioned it a couple times, but it's time to start preparing the people that... Um, that my oldest son, Joshua, who is an officer in the Navy and lives in Jacksonville, Florida, right now in the, in the Navy, he wanted to buy my husband and I tickets to come for Christmas so I could be with my three granddaughters. And, and uh, not only did he find out he had blackout dates, but I said, that's much better for us anyway. We shouldn't be gone from the church on Christmas. Too many special meetings going on. So the plan was to bring us down in January. We're supposed to leave on the 14th and come back the 31st. Now, we're hoping to rent a car after we're there the first week, even though he bought the tickets, and go see my husband's family in Alabama. And hopefully, since it's fallen at the right dates with Brother Rodney's winter camp meeting, hopefully we'll be able to take that car and leave Alabama and go to Tampa for a couple of the days anyway of camp meeting before we head up to fly out of Jacksonville. So... We're going to try to crowd a lot in there. So in the meantime, we have lots of good preachers in our midst. Not too many people this size could say that. And so I, we've made out a preaching schedule that uh, I know I've just handed them out and haven't even got to talk to half of you. If anybody has a problem with the schedule, that's much easier than waiting for everybody to get back to me. When would be the best day for you? It's just too hard to put it together. So I sought the Lord and made it out. So hopefully if there's no problem with that in anybody's part, we're going to be having Brother Vince, Brother Harold, Brother Javier, Brother Taylor, Brother, Brother Neil. And... Um, Boy, looking at how many preachers we have in here, maybe we should stay gone a couple of months and let some more people have some more shots at it. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing good things happen while we're gone. Um, today, of course, is building God's house first offering. And I'm going to give you a few statistics on that. And it came to me late this morning, and I didn't have time to get a hold of Charlotte to double check and verify my numbers but i have enough in my memory that if it isn't exact i know it's very close i just wanted to tell you a, a few more things about this special offering that we're doing this church when we put an offer on it it was a praise or not a, a, a pray assessed they never did a full appraisal on it and i kind of wish we would have but it would have cost us a lot more money we got by with just a general appraisal, um, but it was assessed by the city at $245,000. And they were asking, I believe they were originally asking 180, I think. 180, 185, something like that. We offered them 160, and they took it. Our realtor said we would insult them by that. My husband said, I don't really care if they're insulted or not, if somebody wants to buy, uh, sell a building. <laughs> enough and he wanted us to offer 150 and I think we're kicking ourselves we didn't at least try it but uh we offered 160 and they took it now how many know assessed at 245 somebody asked him one and the reason he thought that would insult them he said they came down a lot to ask 180 he said they were going to ask he felt like 200,000 and quite frankly I looked at enough buildings to know what they're going for in the city it would have been worth that do you know we looked at several buildings this size or smaller that didn't have an auditorium like this, didn't have the high vaulted ceilings. All the rooms were broken up and we would have had to smash out walls to make an auditorium. And you know what they wanted to lease them for and rent them for? Two to $3,000 a month, all of them that I checked. You know what our payments are? Our, our initial payments on this a month, especially once we got the tax exempt status, we had, to, we had to pay taxes the first couple of months, I think, until we got the status. And, but our payments are five something a month, 500 and something. When they wanted two or 3,000 a month to lease one that wouldn't be ours, we'd never be able to resell, we would have had to put thousands into to get ready. So I felt this was such a godsend when we got it. The man who did the... Um, did the inspection, said, I've never seen a building built so, so well in all the years I've been doing inspections. Of course, it was built by the Carpenters Union because it was a Carpenters Union meeting hall. 
And so everything, there wasn't one thing that had to be done structurally or anything. In fact, we probably could have even gotten by without painting it. It's not like it was a building with big smudges or we just wanted to give it a little spring cleaning. We were able to keep the carpet that was in it. Um, so it, it was an incredible deal to begin with. And we were told, don't mess with the small town banks like Anchor, you know. That the, so we started to look at some other financing that was going to charge us tremendous interest. But I just felt my heart, wait a minute, my husband's done a home through Anchor. We have our personal accounts there. Why not give it a try? And when we went, they said, yeah, we, we want to do business in this town and we want to see people start doing things in this town. They gave it to us at five and a quarter interest. And, um, and they, what they did was um, they took the payments, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? When uh, They amortized. They amortized the payments for 20 years. I don't exactly understand how this works. For 20 years, even though, even though in 10 years, the loan would come up again and either we would have to get them or someone else to refinance it. But how many know if it's amortized, which saves us money, it lowers the payments, which I was really thankful for. If ever we had a month that we could only do the basic payment, we don't have to sweat. It's 500 and some dollars. However, the fact that it was amortized that way for 20 years and the loan would come up again in 10, I looked at the chart. At the end of 10 years, we wouldn't even have hardly touched the principal of what we still owe. And so they're a little tricky when they do that. He says, oh, I'm quite sure with good credit and everything, you won't have a problem refinancing. That may be the case, but how many know the next time they could charge you 10%, depending upon what's going on in the financial situation of America, they could charge you 15%, they could charge you 25, knowing, hey, we're desperate, we gotta keep a hold of this, we're gonna have to pay whatever it is. And so it, it, right away in my heart, I felt we'll do this for now, but we're going to believe God for something better in 10 years and not be facing that refinancing in 10 years. Also, when we first started laying eyes on this and believing it was our building, I had no idea we would have any more than the little bit that we had left over from my traveling ministry and Debbie Rich Ministries. And I'm trying to remember, but I believe we had about $14,000 in the account of my ministry that we also just put into the pot of getting the church and all the things we had to get in it. Now, we still said in faith we were going to do it. How many have heard me say that I've never had the finances to do one thing in this ministry that I've done? And I've been under people who never had the finances to do one thing they've done. But when you've heard from heaven, how many know that's called faith? <laughs> now, to try to do something just because somebody else did it is called presumption and will get you in trouble but when you've heard from heaven you're stepping out on the water still not something solid underneath you that's what faith is but when you step out on it the waters part so we we said we said this is our building and then we were offered fifty thousand dollars for a down payment <laughs> What a glory. I can't imagine if we would have had to borrow uh, like 140 where we would be at right now. But we didn't take the whole 50 on the down payment because how many know there are closing costs and all that? I've, I've just never even delivered all of this before, but I thought you'd be interested in this. The closing costs, you know, were several thousand dollars. Uh, um, even the general appraisal way to get the inspection, getting things turned on again, the gas, the electric, all of that cost. Not to mention, you've got to start out with 50 chairs and, and some basic things and get a platform and get a... And as I announced in the state of the church on Wednesday night, I look around. We have good microphones. We have two wireless microphones. We have a, a brand new refrigerator and stove. We have cabinets that have been installed. A new communion table, a new pulpit, uh, new things out in the foyer. Um, and just got that stand on the wall. All of those things. We buy things that people don't notice. Racks to put the chairs on and storage units and all kinds of things. The decorations for Christmas, for, for uh, Thanksgiving, for all of those things. So we had to use some that was in the account already just to, just to 
make sure. So we used almost all of the 50 on the down payment. I think we used 45 of it and kept five back with some in my ministry. Anyway, we came out by, after closing costs and everything that we still owed 110000 on the building. That is, now, that is now with our double payments because God dropped that in my heart. Just see if the church will reach and pull on this one Sunday. Now, I know a lot of churches that to pay off their buildings have an extra offering like this every Sunday in, in, in their med, midweek service. They keep it there and, and people are given in to just paying off that building. I just felt to do it one Sunday of the month for us to stretch. And we've been able, I think all of them except one or two, we've been able to do at least double payments. In the very beginning, when we started this, uh, some of these offerings were seven or eight hundred dollars, so we even had extra than the double payment. And uh, sometimes lately, they haven't been quite five hundred, and we've had some in it with what's left over from Norway to add to it to make the exact double payment. But I wanted to tell you, this isn't just a flippant. Hey, this is just something I thought we might do. This is, we're believing the only way they would do this loan with a congregation, you know, that was a lot smaller than this one we started. I think we had 12 we started the church with. The only way they would do it is for my husband and I to guarantee the loan, that we will personally back it up, which means our house, our assets, or anything are available if the church couldn't make the payment. But I knew in my heart that we would, and we have, and we're making double ones. So that 110 that we borrowed is now... It may not sound like much to you, but it's now down to, I believe, I haven't seen this week's report yet, but I believe we're in the 102 something now, 102 high, close to 103, but I, I watch each month as it comes down 105, 104, 103. It takes two months for it to come down another thousand because we're talking about 500 and some dollar payments extra. Not, but on those payments, we say to only be applied to principal. So we're, we're watching it whittle down now. And uh, you got to keep your eye on things. Our first few double payments, I thought something's wrong. It's not going down like it should, not with that. So I had to go down there and talk to them. They were trying to do other things with it. I'll just leave it with that. But now it goes directly to the principal, and we're watching it come down very quickly now. And um, so, in other words, in four months at this rate, we should be finally underneath 100000 do you know if we wouldn't been doing this extra payment when I looked at the amortization schedule, I think we would still owe like almost the exact same amount we started with in 10 years. And, and then we would have to refinance and I've already talked about all that. So I'm so thankful for a church that's been given into this, but I wanted to make it a little bit more, uh, more clear. And I'm so thankful that in 10 years, I believe I've been involved in offerings and even taught in some of them where entire big buildings are paid off in one night, where people owed hundreds of thousands of dollars in one night. And I believe God can do anything like that here. I believe that somebody can come in. Remember the story I talked about in Nome after I was there teaching on giving? How the pastor called me and he said, somebody just walked in my, this is a little, a little village church in Nome, Alaska. He said, somebody just walked in my office and said, how much do you still owe in this church? And he said about, about, um, about uh, $8,000. And it, it had been a church that had been there for years and years and years and years. And they said, okay, wrote out a check. And he saw 5000 and he said, wow, that's over half of what we got left. She said, you better look again. He had missed a zero. And she wrote him out a check for 50000 and said, pay off the church, put $20,000 in the church account and put the rest in your own account. You've been a missionary up here for, from Texas for years, never been blessed. It's about time you're blessed. Now, if God could do that when we had just been teaching there, what can he do in our own church? So I'm expecting any day the whole thing's off. But meanwhile, while we do what God tells us to do, and he directed me to do this special offering. Now, it, it's interesting and I'm not saying this in condemnation or guilt because everybody has to do what they feel led to do. But it's usually a few doing much more than they would have to if everybody was doing something for that extra offering. We have enough people in here that if everybody did $50 extra a month, that would more than make that offering. But some end up doing one or 200 or, or so and because some do none and we still make it. That's just like God. 
but I'm believing God that we can pay this off so, so quickly. And you know, even though I spent a lot of time on the main message, I got stirred up today, stirred up just before the Lord this morning, working on a lot of things, and he dropped something in my heart. How many know that I don't teach every week on giving like I used to? Every service I did it. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday morning, Monday night, Tuesday morning, Tuesday night, out on the road. But I probably do it maybe once every four to six weeks in here now. But I guess thinking about this and how far we've come and the miracles God has done, it just made me start thinking about a lot of things. And I want us to look for a few minutes at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 before we receive the offering. And I, I just trust this comes across and gets you as stirred up as it did me. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, reading out of the New King James. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia, that's Greece, was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Did you know that you can have zeal in your giving just like you can have zeal in your praise and worship? Is there a difference in this kind of praise and worship like David did when he saw the ark coming home and he starts twirling and dancing and he's all over the place? Is there a difference in that kind of worship? And Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Is there a difference in the zeal? Absolutely. Is there a difference in zeal and prayer? Well, I'm here, aren't I? I'm saying something. And somebody's like, oh, we're going to connect with heaven tonight. Is there, is there a difference in the zeal of, of a soul winner versus, oh, I don't know. I guess if I'm put in a corner, I might say something about Jesus. There's a difference in the zeal. There is also a difference in zeal in giving. Going back to that story I just shared about Nome, Alaska, I don't want to take all of these stories individually because I got too much other stuff to get into. But remember when I talked about the people interrupting me and running and throwing money? This is early in 1993, I think April of 1993. And I had never seen anything like that in my life. And I thought, I'm five minutes into teaching. What do I do? Do I keep teaching? Do I tell them to stop? What are they doing? Because they're all running out of their seats after that first guy came running and put a $100 bill in each hand. And the people came running and they're falling out and they're giving everywhere. And of course, I've seen that hundreds of times since then. But back then, picture this missionary who had never seen anything like it. I'm like, what do I do? And what are they doing? But as people got excited, and, and the old King James would have said it this way, zeal. But today we'd say as they got excited and stimulated and it got off and people around them and that got off and people around them. Remember the story and uh, some it'll just make you curious because some of you haven't heard these stories but I'm talking to the core of my church who used to hear some of these testimonies in, in my revival meetings so they'll know what I'm talking about. But the story in Arkansas of the night on that Friday night that I'm teaching on the alabaster box and they started doing that and they, the guy, the kid gave his brand new electric guitar away and three cars were given in the church and the pastor got the new golf clubs, he brought his on the altar. Remember that whole story and how five people got saved out of it and the whole thing. You know what happened? Was some people's zeal started affecting the other people until the whole church was drunk in the Holy Ghost and they're falling all over, piling this stuff up. Just a supernatural move of the Holy Ghost. But it started with somebody's zeal in giving, their excitement in giving. And out of it, five people that that church had been praying for, five men for years, ended up getting saved. So this is what he's talking about here. Your zeal has stirred up the majority of them. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that as I said, you may be ready, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared. Is, is Paul a minister of the gospel? Come on. Yes. I'm going to ask you something. What is his subject here that he's teaching? Can somebody tell me? Is he talking about salvation right here? No. What's he talk, is he talking about healing right here? What's he talking about? I've never stopped and asked it that way before, but it just came to me by the Holy Ghost. I want you to see this for as many people that would try to make this message unspiritual, unscriptural, a side subject. 
Paul not only is saying this to them, he has it recorded to say to us today, and he's on one subject only, nothing else, one subject only, giving. He is trying to teach the church what it's about. And he says, and that would take some guts, he'd say, I don't want to find you unprepared for this offering. You need to pray and be prepared ahead of time, he's telling them. I don't want to be ashamed of this confident boasting of you. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. He's even reminding the people that they need that they need to remember that they promised some stuff. Do you know there's a time even to remind people of that? But this I say, he who sows sparingly, what does the word sparingly mean? Can somebody tell me? I'm just going to ask you some questions here because I, I just want to make sure nobody thinks I'm making this up this morning. That's right. That's a very good example. Very, you're, I'm thirsty up here, and I asked Vince for some water. And he brings me about this much. Uh, thanks for bringing me such a sparingly little amount. Sparingly never means an okay amount. It never means great amount. He says, he who sows sparingly will reap greatly. No, what does it say here? Sparingly. Let's go back to Vince's example. We're going to be very real with this because I want you to see some things this morning. So Vince brings me up this much to drink when I'm thirsty. And now it's time to reward him. Now, I may out of the generosity of my heart still reward him with more. <laughs> yeah, he's going, yeah. But according to what this is saying, what, what can he expect back when he's thirsty? The same little bit. Now, if a preacher says this today, give a little, you get a little, give a lot, you get a lot, people be going, oh, how dare he suggest that you need to give your best is this Bible I'm reading. This is Bible. This isn't made up by Kenneth Hagin, Rodney Howard Brown, Debbie. It's not made up. This is Bible. And if we're going to get to the place we want to get to, we have got to see it. And, and you're, I'm going to expound on this in a few minutes. Just, just bear with me. Then he says, so, and he who sows bountifully, what does that mean? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I knew he was going to come up with something good. He's going to go throw me in the river. He who sows bountifully will also reap that way. Some people today would say, you shouldn't even expect to get very much. Shame on you that you're expecting. The Bible says if I sow like that, I'm going to reap like that. Funny, we won't, we won't back up on healing. At least we say we won't back up on it. No, I don't care what the symptoms are. What does the word say? But people are afraid to do that with people about giving, but I'm doing it this morning. Oh, you can't say that because so, look at so-and-so. They've always been a big giver and you can't. I'm not going to back up on what the word says. It says if I sow sparingly, that's how I'll reap. If I, spare, if, if I sow uh, bountifully, I will reap that way. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. People so misunderstand this part. If I don't even get to the message today, maybe we'll start with that tonight. I don't know. I'm not worried about it because once this started stirring up in me this morning, I said, Lord, help me to do it right, what you're showing me. People will say today, well, this must not be working for you. You and your husband don't have a great salary. Maybe it used to work for you when you were part of the river and traveling the world, but I mean, you know, you, you got nice cars, but they aren't Lexus or I don't know what people would say. You, you know, you got a nice home and it is now paid off as of this year. Thank God. But it's just, you know, it's older and it's just a little ranch style. It's, it doesn't look like this is happening for you. I, I don't see where it says having a Lexus, a big, beautiful home, having every desire you could think of is what I'm promising you. All sufficiency. There's not a day I've gone hungry. There's not a day I've gone without a home. There's not a day when he's told us to do something that we have not been able so, to. So sparingly, that's how I'll reap if I spare. 
If, if I sow uh, bountifully, I will reap that way. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. People so misunderstand this part. If I don't even get to the message today, maybe we'll start with that tonight. I don't know. I'm not worried about it because once this started stirring up in me this morning, I said, Lord, help me to do it right, what you're showing me. People will say today, well, this must not be working for you. You and your husband don't have a great salary. Maybe it used to work for you when you were part of the river and traveling the world, but I mean, you know, you, you got nice cars, but they aren't Lexus or I don't know what people would say. You, you know, you got a nice home and it is now paid off as of this year, thank God. But it's just, you know, it's older and it's just a little ranch style. It's, it doesn't look like this is happening for you. I, I don't see where it says having a Lexus, a big, beautiful home, having every desire you could think of is what I'm promising you. All sufficiency. There's not a day I've gone hungry. There's not a day I've gone without a home. There's not a day when he's told us to do something that we have not been able to do it. Sure, would I like to sit down in somebody's meeting and write out a million dollar check and haven't been able to do that? Yes, yet. But then you stop and go, we couldn't do this. We couldn't do the sign. We couldn't do many things that we're doing having all sufficiency that other people go, how did you do that? Only him. Everything is relative, having all sufficiency with what he tells you to do with where you're at at that moment. Anybody in here going hungry? Anybody in here that, that they're putting you in jail or, or taking your kids right now to sell them off as slaves as, as some of the widow women in the Old Testament were facing? No, we have had all sufficiency. You may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now, I want you to notice back in a verse. I, I didn't hit it. Uh, oh, yes, verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Do you notice it doesn't say let each one that has something to give, give. It says let each one give. It doesn't let people off. Have you noticed that? It doesn't say, um, unless you don't have very much. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart. That's why I don't like it. And my husband and I have both stopped ushers. He stopped them in his old church. I don't like it when people just go, okay, we're going to receive the tithe and offering or an offering, whatever it is. And okay, everybody starts passing it. And everybody's just like, oh, here comes a plate. Uh, I, I guess I should do something. I'll just throw, and I don't think about it. Let's see, what do I got? It's coming. I better let it go. We're supposed to purpose in our heart what we give just like we do anything else in God I purpose to quote his word when I'm not feeling good I purpose to do this you've got a purpose to give it, it, giving's never an accident or it's never going to get done right uh, oh haven't thought about it but maybe I'll drop something in here you have to purpose to give and each one does it, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> we have used that so much that it's become a religious cliche to people. Do you know that back in my, my meetings on the road, there were some times when I sensed people that they didn't like this, especially if you went in a place where it had never been taught. You're coming up against religious devils that will scream out in this subject more than any other subject in the world. And when I'd feel that, I'd stop and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Anybody who doesn't want to give, not only do you not have to give, but take out of this offering as it goes around what you want. And people would start to chuckle like, she doesn't really mean that. And, and I would say it again, no, this isn't a joke, really. Take out what you want. If you don't like this and you don't think you have anything to give and you think you're hurting, and I would sometimes see a few people take out. And then I'd just kind of chuckle up here. And there was a time in Finland, I, uh, you know what? We may not get to the second message because I'm feeling some things coming all at one time. I want to see you set free in your heart. In your heart. Where you know that you know this. You know that you know. I was in Finland renting a building that cost, I got a good deal on it, but I, I'm wanting to say it probably costs seven, $800 a night. I'm there for three nights. 
I think I told this a while back, but I'm going to remind you. I had sent a book table over there that cost me probably, the book table itself was probably worth $5,000, but to send it probably cost us almost 1000 and to get it past customs because they held it up. They always tried to in these countries for a bribe or whatever. And, and nobody has sponsored me to come. Nobody, it, it's only going to be the people there and what they give in these three nights. And I've bought my own plane tickets. I'm paying my own hotel. I'm paying my own food. I'm paying my staff's food. I'm, and their plane tickets. And I haven't asked anybody. It's just a free will offering. But when I started teaching that first night, and I had heard the people of Finland say, oh, when Pastor Rodney was here, people got so mad when he was teaching on giving. Different countries are known for it more than others. And they'll back up and you feel that thing get... It's funny, some of my easiest country is India, Nepal, Philippines, much poorer than Scandinavia. But they knew they had to get it to survive. And they would just come running and get a hold of it. But the people who have plenty, that's usually the ones that resist it. Because they feel you're getting too close to their pocketbook. And the pocketbook and the heart are, are intertwined like this. And so I felt that heavy resistance and I kept preaching and I could feel it getting heavier. And all of a sudden I announced, when I heard it coming out of my mouth, part of me is wanting to go, stop Debbie before it's too late. You're not going to make it if, if, if you say this. Because the head lies getting engaged when you give it a chance. But I said, no, we're not going to receive an offering tonight. I'm only there three nights. If I added up what this trip has cost me by now, and I didn't have anything in the bank when I left. So if I don't get anything, and I sure can't get enough in two nights, my head says. Didn't know how I was going to in three nights. And now I hear myself say, we're not going to receive an offering. But bless God, I'm going to teach all night on it until you get free. And then I said, ushers, give away the whole book table. And you could hear people now starting to gasp like, oh, give away. I mean, Pastor Rodney's always selling his. I mean, he gives away some things while he's talking about it but I said give away the whole thing it took him quite a while to give every last thing I used to carry a big one in those days they're giving away everything and I said and all of a sudden I kept teaching and kept teaching and I heard people begin to cry and then I heard I heard it when it broke you know those things in the spirit it went from people just crying all over the place to joy right in the middle of teaching on giving to tremendous joy and people falling out of their seats and now they're coming running and they're trying to give like I've seen happen many places and I stopped them and said, no, I will not even allow it. Even though the Spirit of God is all over you, don't lose what he's doing in your heart. But I put my word out, we will not receive an offering this night, and we will not receive one. So I said, try to start picking up what you're already given, and I hope you can all sort it out. Because they were coming like a stampede. I didn't take a thing from that night. In the next two nights, God gave us a miracle where we met the budget, but that wasn't what it was about. Those people were just drunk in the Holy Ghost the rest of the time. And they were free in all the other areas. The praise and worship changed. The response in the altar calls changed. Everything changed. Because what people don't know is where they are bound in one area, it is holding them back in other areas as well. And they think it's not even related. Amen. Pastor Rodney used to always tell us, I know the night that revival hit the place. It's always the night that the offering jumped. It can be this, 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 and then they'll say, strangest thing happened, Pastor, on Tuesday night or Wednesday night or whatever night it is. All of a sudden, the offering quadrupled. And it's funny. You go from people just kind of like this in the joy to tremendous joy. You go from a five coming up to the altar for salvation to a hundred coming up for salvation. Always, that same night that that breaks, the other breaks. And I, I used to listen to him, and I thought, boy, I need to start paying more attention to that in my meetings on the road. And sure enough, we'd look at each other and go, he's right, isn't it? The very night that that broke, this broke, and this broke, we go out to San Diego, California, and Richard and I went out with Pastor Rodney. And Pastor Rodney left and said, Richard, you and Debbie are supposed to stay here in this church. That church today is one of the churches that stayed in revival, and that pastor has been on Pastor Rodney's board for many years, Pastor Mark Spitzbergen. And Pastor Mark isn't just a pastor. 
He's a businessman. He's a scientist. They had him on the board of research for breast cancer for many years. You start talking to Pastor Mark in a back room and you're going, Oh, he knows something about everything. He raises racehorses. He's an entrepreneur. Him and his brother invented a machine that people use in construction today all over the world. He knows, so he's not some come by lately guy. But here we are out in his church, and it's one of those churches I've told you about before that Richard said, Debbie, you do the giving and I'll do the fire. And I'm like, Richard, can I be honest with you? I let you pick every time. (laughs) We started talking about some of these stories when he was here last weekend. I said, I always let you pick. And I know I'm known as the giving teaching lady. But before Brother Rodney had me start teaching on giving, I, 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 I do the fire in all my own meetings. I get tired of being known as that. People, I mean, I've had some people say, when I see that lady up on the platform, I won't even pull up at the river because every time I've been there when she's teaching, I've had to give my cars away. And my, so now I won't even pull up when I see her up there. And uh, I, said, I said, tonight I want to do the fire. You do the giving. He said, okay. And he got up and taught on giving for a while. And it's not that Richard doesn't do a good job on it. He does. But, I, but those people were stiff, kind of like the Finnish people that night, where it takes more than a little dabble, do you? And I knew he probably felt he couldn't finish the job because I wouldn't have enough time then. I got up there, and I started to say, okay, we're going to talk about the fire. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I was back over on giving. Now, we've already received the offering. Richard taught on it. And I'm trying to go back to the fire, and I'm over on giving. And I just gave up and said, people, we aren't through on this subject. I said, it's got to break open. And as I continued that same weeping and that sound all across the audience as though you were preaching something with heavy conviction, because how many know there can be heavy conviction with this if that's an area where people have been bound and stingy in? So you hear this weeping all over the auditorium and all of the sudden the joy broke forth in the middle of that crime. People are drunk of the Holy Ghost everywhere and I just kind of went, because Pastor Rodney had been out there for a week and Uh, at the heaviest some nights it was kind (laughs) of and I thought how come he's not seeing the usual breakthrough he sees that's where it was at that's what was holding it back they couldn't even get free in the Holy Ghost because of that mess but all of a sudden they're totally drunk in the Holy Ghost next thing I know a little girl I'll never forget it little girl maybe four five at most comes up and she's got this little tiny purse And tears are running down her face. She kneels at the altar and she goes, I want Jesus to have my all. And she takes out of the little purse a fingernail polish and two pennies. And she and she goes, He hasn't had my all. And I mean, I'm just up there, ah, I'm just gone. And the next thing I know, a little ten year old boy brings his tennis shoes, the ones that light up. I just got these for Christmas, and I've got to give them to Jesus. And I'm telling you, that broke all over the place. They are running home. They're getting stuff. They're stacking it up. And, um, and I wasn't even trying to do a giving teaching. We have received the offering. I was trying to preach in the fire. Guess what? I did. Do you know that can be so intertwined? The fire burns up whatever chaff and dross in any area. We think, oh, the fire comes, people quit drinking. Hopefully that's true. We think, oh, they'll quit committing adultery. Hopefully that's true. But the fire is to burn up anything, attitudes, unforgiveness, places that we're holding back from the Holy Ghost, places that say, you can clean out all my other drawers, but this is my secret stash compartment. Just have everything else, Holy Ghost, but this is something I've hung on to for a long time, and my mom was like this, and my grandma was like this, and great grandma, and this is my, don't touch this area. And he goes, that's the one I'm going for. And many times that is that drawer of, What's mine is mine. I'll give you my life as far as a change and what I used to do, but I won't give you what I get to spend on. It's a big one in Western society, a big one. So they got free. We have revival. I can tell you that all over the world, similar stories, but none of those were the ones I was going to share with you today. Oh, I got to admit that where this first probably dropped in my heart today, there's only some Sundays that I get a chance to turn on the river and listen while I'm getting ready. 
And even when I do, I don't usually listen in time for their giving teaching. But this morning, I was back working on several things, on several things, brushing up on what I thought was going to be my message and, and doing the announcements on my computer and stuff. And I thought, I'm going to have this on in the background, just get recharged. And Brother Rodney came out and did a teaching from 1 Corinthians 9. Now, mine's very different this morning, as I knew it would be. But it got me stirred up, and I'm just bawling at the computer, going, oh, I hope the newcomers at the river can get a hold of this because it's like the way he used to teach it when I got a hold of it in Alaska. And look what it's done for me. He plowed it through for all the rest of us because like he said this morning, he said, you know, when I was a poor preacher in Africa, I'm just going to share a couple of his testimonies. He said, I was complaining to God. I'm not going to ask how many of us have ever done that. God, this isn't right. I'm preaching your word. I got a family. I got a wife, and now I got a couple. Ba- this isn't right. I go places, and they give me a box of asparagus for revival, for doing a week. How am I supposed to take care of my family on that and get them a house or buy them clothes? I go somewhere else, and they bear. God, this isn't right. And he thought God was going to say, that's right, Brother Rodney. You're my servant, and they aren't treating you right. That's terrible. But he said, that's not what he said at all. He said, it's your fault. <laughs> and he said, what? I'm out here preaching your word, doing the best I can. And God said, it's your fault. You're not a giver. And he said, oh, okay, we're going to have us some trouble now, God. I would love to be, but I don't have anything. He said, my word doesn't say if you have something. It says, let each one give as he's purposed in his own heart. He said, you will never have anything till you become a giver first. And he said, well, I don't even know. I, I have nothing. I mean, people are giving me asparagus. And he said, he, he looked, he made the correction in his heart. He started looking around. What can I give? He said, I started giving tithes away. He said, at one time I gave 150 tithes away. After all, the Lord says, bring all your tithes into the storehouse. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he said, I started giving tithes away. He said, and then when I finished with that, I start giving furniture away. He didn't tell this today, but I've heard him tell this part before where Adonica came home one day and he said every time she came home, another piece of furniture was missing and he'd always try to stand in front of it. But this time he gave the couch away and he didn't know how, even when he, back when he was bigger, he didn't quite know how to. <laughs> she goes, isn't something missing? Mm. <clears throat> well, maybe the couch. I just gave it away. <laughs> And he said sometimes somebody would give him a little money and as fast as it would come to him, it was going through his hands. And she'd go, Rodney, this is okay, but I was believing God for some money and we just got some and you just gave it away again. He said if we need $1,000, is 100 bucks going to fix that? She said no. And he said, well, I learned way back then that if it's not enough for your need, it's probably your seed. And he said, this still isn't going to fix anything. We need that, you know, like now. (laughs) And the hundred just won't fix it at all. So why can't I believe it's seed in my hand for what we need? And continue to live like that. There's got to be something. I got clothes. I got, he said one day she came home and not only gave him furniture away, but he said he was standing in his his boxer shorts and a t-shirt. She said, one of these days I'm going to come home and find you naked. You're giving everything away. But, oh, she doesn't regret that anymore. It seemed to take her longer. They will both say that. But one day, because she was the financer in the family. How many know the person that's writing out the bills and stuff always gets a little bit more stressed about it? But she said the day came that she went, wait a minute, I got to get in this with him. Not, not be holding him back, not even go, well, he's the giver, but I just go along with it. No, we got to get in this together. And so she became one like him. (laughs) He says people would say to him, well, you're just blessed because you're in the ministry. He said, then let me ask you this. How come I have to help so many broke preachers all the time? They're in the ministry too. (laughs) Doesn't seem to be working for them just because they're in the ministry. He has to help break them through, and I was one of them. And thank God that he did. I'm just going to... I'm just going to remind you a few things. I'm telling you the first time in Alaska, and you've heard the whole whole story, how I too didn't like it in the first day, I think. 
because I had never heard anybody take this kind of time. But when the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I've sent him here for this for you, not for the, I thought, no, you've sent him here for the joy. I've had a broken heart and it needs to get healed up and it's been getting healed up. You sent me here to watch these altar calls and people, no, no, you're already having that in your church. I sent you here and him here for you to get a hold of this or you can't ever fulfill the call I have in your life. And I was so shocked. I was so shocked, and I sat up and repented. You know the rest of the story, how I shook, how I cried, how God spoke to me, how he came off the platform and spoke to me. Now, from that day on, I got a hold of it. I got a hold of it where without even thinking as, something, as fast as something would hit my hands, it would go through it. And my helpers would just shake their head, but they still say to this day, by the way, one of them, one lady that worked for me for a while, a year or so, she called me this morning, um, and she asked for prayer. And uh, she asked if the church would pray, too. I prayed for her on the phone. But a lot of things have happened in her life over the last few years where she strayed and just got away from him. But how many know when he has a hook in your jaw, you can't go very far? Wow. And not only has she come back, and we've been talking periodically on the phone, and it's been a, a while again now, but she said, oh, she goes, Debbie, just the things you've sowed to me and the times you've prayed for me. She said, it's all coming back now. She's a nurse and she's making good money. But she said that where she's at now, the fire is starting to fall and she's getting all these opportunities to pray for people and the anointing is just shaking them. And, and she said, I feel like my call's coming back. And I said, of course it is. The giftings and callings of God are without repentance. And she'd just cry on the phone and she'd say, but while God's doing all this, somebody's reared up their, uh, uh, somebody possessed basically that with a devil has given her all kinds of fits off on the job. So we stopped and we rebuked that. But her, LaShawn, Katie, Priscilla, so many that worked at my side would go. <laughs> they still say to this day, finance is the, is the only thing I never worry about because I work for Debbie. <laughs> and I'd see God when we owed $30,000. They'd say I'd see her get right out a $5,000 thing on a credit card. And we got to have it by, this is Sunday, and we got to have this by Monday or we go down the tubes. I mean, we don't even let the account get us as close now as I used to when I needed 20000 a week. Many times we'd look and I'd say, what do we got in there? 25 bucks. After 25 bucks, they close the account. Okay, let's give 5000 again tonight. And they go, and God never once in 20 years failed us. But it wasn't just that. There are so many things you would hear individual testimonies as I came back holding revival through the years. But I started to think about it today and I just started weeping. There would be times somebody would come up and say, God just told me to give you this one carat, one time a two carat diamond ring. And most of the time without thinking, without even thinking, I'm just like, huh, that lady's going through a lot over there. I just feel to bless her with it and would just let it go. And I wasn't wearing anything any close to that. A time I'm helping him in his camp meeting, somebody said, a couple has left something for you in the back room. I go back. It's a full-length fur coat that fit like a glove. I, I don't even know who these people were. And how that fit me in the arms and fit me everywhere, I turned around and sewed it to somebody else and never wore it once. I think about it sometimes when it gets cold up here. Full-length mink a silver fox coat, turn around. One time in a church, they had a new keyboard, and I said, wow, I'm believing God. That wasn't a hint for them to give me theirs at all. I would have never dreamed of that. But I said, I'm believing God for one like that to take on the road because half the time I get stuck doing my own worship services in the morning because people are working, worship teams are working in morning services. And the pastor came up to me, and he said, I just talked to my... My board, we're going to give you this one. It's brand new. We're going to give it to you. You know what? The first church I went into after that, they said, boy, we need a new keyboard. This one's falling apart. And I went, here. <laughs> now, I found out later that not the pastor so much that gave that to me, but he had a guy on his financial team that, you know, he's, it, and it usually is that type. The more money they have, the more they got to plan it out. And he said, that wasn't right. We gave her that keyboard and she gave it away to somebody else. I'm just going to tell you something, folks. If you ever give me something, don't give it to me if it always has to stay here. Because if God speaks to me, I might turn around and give it again. And if I give you something, 
If I give you something, there's no strings. Now, I gave that to you because you were in need, but don't you turn around and give it to somebody else. That's wrong. A gift is a gift. You may have done it because you felt that person needed it, but if they feel it's seed for them to give to somebody else, God's going to do something better for them anyway. Amen. Don't have strings ever attached to your giving. But there were times that I couldn't even do something quick enough. I'm in a service of Brother Rodney's last night of camp meeting, and literally, I've given that week, I, I don't know, I, I hate to throw out figures when it's been so long and I can't remember exactly, but I believe, I believe the ministry itself had probably given $15,000 that week or something. I myself had given till my own account was empty and till my own credit cards were full. And now I just got a call that morning from the pastor where I'm going next. And he wants to cancel revival on me. And one of the things he said was, you know, the church I used to have, Debbie, they were big givers. But the church I'm at now, even though it's three times the amount of people in this church, they, they don't give. They don't give like that other church did. And he said, I know you. You're at Rodney's camp meeting, aren't you? And I said, yes. He said, I know you. You've probably given everything. And you pay for your own plane tickets. I'm not even sure you'll get your plane ticket back here. And I said, when have you ever known me to worry about that? God's called me to come to your church. That's not your responsibility. If, if they don't give me two cents, if I don't get enough for my plane ticket, that's between me and God. It's not your worry. Okay, he says, go ahead and come. Now, I've just heard that Friday morning. This is Friday night. I've heard they probably won't even give you your plane ticket back. And they're receiving the offering, and oh, I wanted to give something again, but I didn't have, I didn't have anything left in the ministry credit cards or my own. I couldn't. And then all of a sudden, it dropped in my heart. You've got a necklace on that I just am not going to take the time to go into that story, but the necklace at that time was sentimental to me, and, and I had also, it represented many things. It had a whale's tail from Alaska, and anyway... It was the only expensive piece of jewelry I'd ever bought myself, and I was making payments on it. And I think it was it, it was a f what they called a black pearl, but it was it would ch it was translucent. It would change colors with whatever you put on. It would reflect that. Plus, had that gold whale's tail with a diamond in it. From anyway, I don't remember what it cost. It wasn't outrageous, but more than I had cash for, and I was making payments on it. I think it was something like, I want to say $3,000 or something, but I had just made a couple of payments. And the Holy Ghost said, take that off and put it in the offering. And little did I know the day would come. He asked me to do that with a car that I'm making payments on for the next six years. So, but this was a step that way. And I took it off and put it in the offering. I didn't even think twice about it. I did, remember, he says, God loves a joyful giver. I didn't go... How come I'm always getting asked to give like this? I suppose they expect an offering tonight too. Here we, Hang on to it if you do it like that. You're going to need it. But I gave it and I broke out just in this victorious, oh God, may nothing that I ever have, may I never hold it close to me, but let it just be for whatever. If I get to keep it, fine. If you want me to give it to somebody else, fine. If you want me to put an offering, fine. Let it always be that free. Went on up to Alaska, and not only did we do a, have a week's glorious revival, where the first Sunday morning the whole church came to the altar. 150 people, when I gave the salvation call, I thought, they've misunderstood. <laughs> they must think I'm just asking for a deeper consecration. So I said it again, if you aren't right with God, if he came right now, if it, 150 people stood at the altar. And the pastor told me later, he said, oh, we needed revival, didn't we? And I said, I'd say so. And they jumped in, and it was an Assembly of God church. None of them had known about Brother Rodney or any of the ways we conduct meetings. They jumped in from day one, and they gave, and they gave. And the pastor said, I've never seen anything like it. At the end of that one week, $20,000 came in my offering. And I had the boldness to take up a second offering on Friday night for Brother Rodney's Good News New York crusade. 5000 came in for that. Now... That last day, a couple in the church said, would you come down to our jewelry store and look it over? 
and just pray over it because we want it to succeed. We're kingdom-minded, and we just want you to pray a blessing. Sure, I will. Somebody else needed to talk to me about something, so I got late getting to the jewelry store. By then, the couple was gone. But I thought, that doesn't matter. They called me down here to pray over their store. I'll pray over their store. I just walked the aisles. God bless these people. Bless the store. Lord, may the eyes be kingdom-minded. And while I'm praying, because I was there a while, you know, I'm seeing everything, and there's unique jewelry. Well, maybe not so unique today, but back then in, in Alaska, these tourist towns would carry unique jewelry, knowing the cruise ships, and they had this pink sapphire. I, had, I didn't even know sapphires could be pink. I thought they were only blue. Pink sapphire set in a fire opal band that had all these colors in it, turquoise and pink. I'd never seen anything like it. And, of course, I mean, it was just shining through the... I just looked and went... I've never seen anything. I didn't say that out loud, but I'm thinking in my heart, I've never seen anything like this. And then I just kind of went like this and went, boom. I, the price tag on it, if I remember right, was something like six or $7,000. And I just grinned and thought, do people really pay that for a ring? And I, I walked on. There's two employees in the store. They're off doing other things. I don't think anybody's seen me do this. To this day, I don't even know if they have. I guess I'll never know. So I finally meet this couple for lunch. They had asked me to come to lunch after I prayed over the jewelry store. And at the end, they said, our lives are changed forever. And I said, well, that's why we come. That's awesome to hear. And they said, by the way, we have just a little token of our appreciation. Now, they were there before I was there. And I came from the jewelry store. And I, I, oh, I see it's a little box. And I thought, well, they're jewelry store owners. So there's a good chance it's going to be a ring, a, a, a necklace, a bracelet in here probably. And I open it up. There is that ring in my size. And I went, and I started to cry. And they're just smiling. And I said, I just came from your store. I just looked at that ring. They never said anything. I said, did you know that? They never said anything. No matter what I asked them, they never said anything. And uh, I heard, I'll never forget this as long as I live. I heard the Holy, I didn't even tell them. I heard the Holy Ghost on the inside of me say, when you gave that necklace, I never heard you say, and then he said this, he said there would be nothing wrong with it. But I just took note that you never said, I'm sewing jewelry, I'm believing to get jewelry back, at least this nice, if not nicer. I mean, you're, you said, Lord, with the same measure, nothing like that. I just heard you say, I wish I had something else to give, something that would make it different, something that would be expensive, something that would... And he said, because of that, not only have I rewarded you in this offering here this week and take, and Brother Rodney, but I gave you back something personal that nobody knew about except me and you that you had even looked at. And as long as I can trust you that things never own you, I can let you have some things. Now, I think I got to wear that ring. Again, in time, it's hard to remember. I might have got to wear it two months <laughs> and I went to another church <laughs> and the pastor's wife there it was a young couple they were struggling she tells me how they don't even have a washer and dryer and she married a guy that had two or three kids she had three or four and now they've got like six or seven kids between them and and I stayed with them I had a washing machine and dryer delivered to their house, and the Lord said, give her that ring. And when I gave it to her, it doesn't even fit her. Your head says, she can't even wear it unless she gets something done. She put it on her little finger, and it wouldn't even go down in her little finger. She's a lot thinner than I was, but her hands were bigger. We have very small fingers. And uh, my head said, she do I bet this goes in a drawer somewhere. But that d does that make a difference? Not to God. Not to God. But there are some people who go, see, God wouldn't even have you do that if somebody can't. It's not about the need. We are so need-led that unless, okay, if somebody really is, there have been times that people have deep needs. Washer and dryer was a need. But I felt led to do a thing with it that wasn't a need. That she, I don't even know, she, I haven't even talked to them since then. Years ago, I, she might have given it to somebody else. She might have taken it to the pawn shop. I have no idea. Might still be in a drawer. And I loved it. That's not the point. If I didn't love it, I should have just kept it. Because there's a real key in giving. Let's see. You know, Brother Rodney gave ties. I got 10 of them. Which ones don't I like very well? I bet I could give those. That's not even giving. 
That's not even giving. Now, in the course of that, people hear, oh, somebody gave you a ring here. Somebody did this here. And they're like, how does, has nothing to even to do with these specific things, but you can't, you can't get the heart across without giving specific examples. It has everything to do with, there is so much of that jewelry. Now, I want to get to this. When he proposed to me, we go to revival in uh, Bremerton, Silverdale, actually, they were at then. Nobody knew we were even seeing each other that was in that revival, except for, of course, the family. Nobody in that church knew it all. Nobody. That he proposes that day in the daytime, nobody knows about that yet. Like I said, the pastors, the people in the church don't even know where, they just think it's a visiting pastor coming, sitting in the audience with some of his people like we have happen a lot. He says to me when he proposes, I don't have a ring yet, but I'm looking online. I'm looking for one for you. Going to the meeting that night, I'm teaching Charlotte, can witness this. I am teaching on giving, but not the alabaster box, which makes it even more unusual to me. I'm teaching for, I don't know, maybe it was 1 Corinthians 9. I have no idea where it was from. The pastor's wife, Hannah, that you now know, jumps up. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Miss Debbie. And I know you're not teaching on the alabaster box, but she's heard me teach on that one before. And she said, but God spoke to me. I must give you my alabaster box. And she said, I'm kind of embarrassed. And I know you're still teaching. And I know the gift isn't going to make sense. You're a single woman. I don't know what it's all about. But God says, I have to give you the most precious thing I have that belonged to my husband, to Pastor Jason's grandma. And it's a wedding set, and it's kind of embarrassing since you're not married or anything. But he said, I must do it tonight. The rubies that wrap around it are my favorite color. My favorite color is red. Ruby's my favorite gemstone. I had had a, a fairly cheap costume, I mean, maybe about $200 ruby ring that I had just given to Richard's wife, Rhonda Moore, that she couldn't wear. I had no rubies left now. God even knew that. How many times do wedding rings have rubies wrapped around them? Not real often. That's not the all of the story. Two months before that, or it, no, I don't even think it was two months, at the winter camp meeting, just a few weeks before that, the lady I just mentioned that used to work for me, Michelle, when she was working for me, I knew she was struggling in some area, and somebody had given me a one-carat diamond ring. And instead of keeping it, I felt to give it to her and say, God knows your needs. He knows things you're struggling with. He's still with you. I had forgotten it. I had forgotten that had happened a couple of years before. And some things had happened between Michelle and I, and I let her go. And needless to say, she was not happy. And it was a year or two of not so good. <laughs> and her not even speaking to me, her not, anyway. But she suddenly showed back up at the river at that camp meeting just that had taken place a few weeks before that. She's crying. She's repenting. It shouldn't have taken me so long to repent, but it did. I'm so sorry. Do you remember you gave me a one-carat diamond ring once upon a time? And I said, honestly, I've forgotten that. Yeah, I guess I do now that you mention it. She said, God told me I had to bring it back to you, and I had to do it this camp meeting. She had just given me a one-carat diamond. These pastors just gave me a wedding set with a smaller diamond in it. I took that diamond out, used it on his rings, and had the one carat just given back to me, put in this. And we knew these rings were from God, that somebody repented bringing a one-carat diamond back. Somebody else who doesn't know you're seeing somebody is embarrassed to give you a wedding set. People think those things just fall on people. He said just the other day, sometimes I feel guilty that I didn't buy you your wedding set, but why would I when I know God gave this to us? I said, why would you? Something so beautiful, so unique. And by, by the way, he did add an anniversary band to it just, just to know that was something between us. Those things, now if people hear these stories, when I've shared the stories that I'm not going to today about the Corvette, for instance, and, and how that came about, when I've shared this story, it's all about what preceded it, not getting a vet. It's about God having to have your heart. And then you walk into a meeting and that drive. Those things aren't a coincidence. 
And when I told that story at CPNC, the majority of people went, oh, that's awesome that God does things. In fact, the man who later got mad was one of them who rejoiced. That's so awesome. And he said he, he's related to Vince, and I can just go ahead and say it. That's how Vince got up here was this guy came, and, and he came with him. And anyway, they both came into the church but only Vince remained. <laughs> but anyway, the guy got so excited about giving that he just started giving some stuff, and I hear his wife's pregnant, and what did I feel led to buy for them? Was it a washer or something? And washer and dryer, or washer, or, I don't know. So then he follows me to the next set of meetings. Now I've given my computer. Now, now how many know you can, oh, there's so much that I can't just teach with my words. You've got to catch it by the Holy Ghost. I've seen people go crazy with giving because they get it in their heart. And I've seen people go, boy, this seems to have worked. Where I gave a couple things, the evangelist saw it, and she's so proud of me that I'm getting a hold of it, and she's giving back to me. Maybe I'll just keep doing that and telling people what I'm giving. Hey, guess what I've given now? My computer expecting that somebody's going to catch that and go, well, let's give you a better one. And when he didn't keep that quickly, getting everything come back as quickly as he thought he should, he turned against God, which meant, means he never met him anyway, turned against the whole message and then started telling people, that horrible evangelist talks about getting Corvettes and it's all about getting cars. Anybody who was there in those meetings knows it was never about getting a car. It was never about driving a Corvette. If it was, I'd still have one because the second one I got, I could have driven up here. He tried to get me to do it. He said, we can get somebody to tow it. We can get somebody to drive it. And I could have kept making the payment. I mean, somebody gave me 10000 for a down payment. Now, that's the kind of people they are. Let me throw that in. They are people who were living in a trailer with their daughter and all of her kids, her daughter going through a divorce. And they said, we know with your first vet, you paid it off early and everything God did with that but we know that somebody took advantage of you and you had to sell it just to pay off their debt. We want you to have another one. And we have brought $10,000 for a down payment. They're living in a trailer. Most people who don't have a giving heart would say, you know, when I get a nice house and, and get out of the trailer, maybe I'll think about doing something like that. They got a hold of this that if you aren't going to stay here, you give first. And so they brought $10,000 for a down payment for the second vet. And because I was having to be gone on the road all the time, you know how much I got to drive that? One week. It only had 1,000 miles on it when I bought it. The first one, I think, had 6,000 on it when I got it. This one only had 1,000 miles on it. This one had navigation, the power. Uh, the first one didn't have a power hood that comes down because they didn't make them yet then in 2001, but they did in 2005 where you just press a button and it comes down. It had everything, everything. And I got, I searched on the internet to be a good steward, get the best deal. A new one like that was 65. I paid 45 for it. And they gave me a $10,000 down payment for it. But my payments were still pretty hefty. I only got to drive it a week. Other people drove it. In fact, I just found out from another pastor that he drove it to a conference and got a speeding ticket while I was, he said, I never told you all these years and I've always felt guilty about it. And, and, uh, but anyway, I got to drive it one week when my husband came and got me. And he said, well, let's just take it back up. I said, no, you don't need to be burdened with this payment and neither do I. The ministry is probably changing gears, going to Washington. And we just, we just need to be free to do whatever God tells us to do. And I didn't go, he can tell you. I didn't go, oh, I, one went because of someone else's greed. And now somebody gives me another one. Look at this beautiful baby. I, gotta, I went, no, I don't want this. I want us to be free to pursue the call of God. Any way he takes us or if things come down for a while and I wasn't going in, it shouldn't have to come down, not the way I've given. No, no, there was none of that. In fact, we had somebody call about the vet. We put it in the newspaper, what, one day or something. Somebody called and said, I want, you to, I want to look at it, but you've got to drive clear. We, had, we were so busy trying to get all my stuff out of storage house, move it, put it in a big truck. Now we've got to go clear across to another city to take this vet to him. And we said, before we come, we better know that you're planning on getting it. You've seen a picture. We've described everything. Yeah, I'm going to get it. It's for sure. Come across town. And he looks at it, and he says, yeah, it's everything that you said it was but my wife doesn't like the idea, so I'm not going to get it. Like, Okay, now we're running out of time. 
I asked a couple of friends if I could leave it in their driveway to sell later. Nope, you're leaving Tampa and you're going to, uh, you're going to Washington. You can't leave it here. We couldn't even get anybody to help us get furniture out or anything because anyway, I said, you know what? I'm gonna take it to the closest car lot that I know sells vets. I said, I've paid enough of it off and got a good enough deal to begin with that they'll, they'll love to take it for what I owe on it. And when I walked in and told the guy, would you, just, would you just write me out a check for what I owe on it? He went, would I? Yes, in a minute. If we would have had time, I would have gone back to see what the new sticker price was. He had to write me out a check for 40, but I'll bet you he turned around and put a sticker price of 60, 65 back on it. Oh, I want, I want you to get this. I'm going to come down off here. I, I've just quit worrying about the second message. We can start on it tonight. That's, a, that's another advantage of two, two services in a day. It's another reason I haven't taught on this that much because I feel too cramped in just one Sunday morning to get everything in. But I'm not going to back off not hitting this once in a while. People don't have enough time in one service, whether it's Brother Rodney, whether it's somebody else. I, I know there are people that manipulate this message and people that take it out of its context and people who fed their own greed with it. Of course, we know there's been that kind of perversion. There is with any part of the gospel. But I'm not gonna back off of the truth because some have done that with the message. This is what enabled this lady out in that cruddy old trailer. If I had it up, we'd show it again that had the little boy come out and say, Mom, do I have to give up my puppy? We got to live in with somebody else? Yeah, but it's just temporary, honey. And where are we going to sleep? I don't know, but it's temporary. <laughs> and we were only living in a trailer then, but we're having to move out of the trailer and move in with Noel and Edna. And, and that's right then I got a hold of this message and my kids saying, Mom, you keep giving like that. We're never going to have our own house. That makes sense in the natural. My dad, what is this stupid thing you're doing up there? Is this missionary? Your kids are going to starve. Dad, I promise you, nobody's starving. Don't worry about it. And then God, it allows me to buy him a new car later before he dies. Within the natural, everything looked upside down. People could think, man, she's staying in our house and she's giving. And uh, there's a lot of things if you want to tear everything apart that doesn't make sense to the head. But I kept saying, boys, you can't outgive God. And I'll never forget Joshua. All three of my boys come into my house in Tampa for the first time. But I can still see Joshua, the oldest, who lived through the most with me and saw all the transitions and knew everything behind the scenes. Just going. And right then there was a new Pontiac. That was the days before the vets. Uh, the Pontiac that somebody from here, from Silverdale, had stood up in a, in a service and said, I'm buying you a car. They wanted me to buy a luxury car, but I wouldn't. And I settled for that medium-sized car, but it was all paid for. And they went out and saw the new car and looked at the house, and my bedroom was about as big as my house was in Alaska. <laughs> and uh, Josh said, boy, Mom, I remember when we moved in with Nolan Edna, and you kept saying we couldn't outgive God, and I thought you were crazy. And now look what God has done for you. And I saw the tears coming down his face. Then my dad came on vacation, my unsaved dad at the time. And I catch him, and I heard, I heard footsteps, and I went in the bedroom, my bedroom, and my dad was going. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm counting off the feet of your bedroom. I said, why didn't you just ask me? He said, your bedroom is longer than the hallway of my, my whole home. They have a 900 and some square foot house. Still, that, still, that's what my mom's in that dad built when I was going in kindergarten. And then my dad looked up and he said, I, I didn't think you could make it doing this. <laughs> and I used that. First, he fought me about giving or even teaching on it. He said, if I was, he actually came out and said one day in the car, if I was ever in a meeting and you started to say something about giving, I'd get up and walk out. And I said, how interesting. I've been in your country western meetings and I've never said if they start to sing about divorce or adultery, I'm going to get up and walk out. And he said, well, I, I hate those preachers talking about giving. He had said that just a year previous. And then he came to my house. 
And I thought, is he going to start in again and how I must be taking all the poor people's money? And But he walked around and, and uh, he said, I didn't think you could do this. And I said, I couldn't. But I have a God. I have a God, Dad. And then he, the Lord told me to buy him that car and that's what broke him. He burst out crying and he said, I didn't think I could ever even have a newer car, let alone a brand new one. And you were the only one of my kids that wasn't married and that I was worried about starving and you used to be beaten. And I'd, I, he told me, he said, every day at the air guard, he said, when the phone would ring, he said, my stomach would jump. And he said, I would think that's Debbie in the hospital or dead that her husband has killed her. And he said, you don't know what it was like to live with that. And he said, to see... And now you're buying me a new car. And I said, Dad, that's only the goodness of my good God that's healed up my heart and has restored everything. And he wants to do it for you. And then I just kept going and led him in the sinner's prayer and the smile that came on his face. Uh, It is the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. I know that I'm always in danger when I preach very much in this message of the whole thing being misunderstood. You're in danger of that with anything in the gospel. Oh, don't use that word drunken when you talk about joy and don't use, uh, there's something with everything. Don't talk about sin, you're preaching condemnation. Don't talk about joy, you make it all sound too good. Don't pray, huh. Don't preach about healing. You'll make people feel guilty if they're sick. Don't preach about, I mean, there's something with everything. (laughs) But whatever this talks about is what I must talk about. That makes it so simple. We were talking this morning. I didn't even tell him I was going to do this because I didn't know I was going to do this much of this. But we were saying it makes it really simple. If Jesus and Paul and Peter could talk about it, then surely we can talk about it, whatever it is. (laughs) Really simple. And he's taken a whole chapter here and he does in the chapter before just on giving. And he takes one in 1 Corinthians 9 as well. And he takes many more than that. Just, okay, church, about giving, let me straighten you out here. Let me help you here. Because evidently it was something we would need. Now, everything is so relative. We're in a different place here beginning this. But I thought, God, help me to get this across to people. I can see it, but I don't know how to vocalize it. It's different, and yet it's still all the same. Maybe I haven't been handed $100,000 yet, like I was in a meeting in Tulsa back when I, uh, yeah, that's why I said, yeah. But I was handed 50 for this building. How many people just walk around, somebody hands up out of a little congregation of, at that time, a dozen people, says, I'll give you 50. How many would even think that's possible? That's just the same. How many are able to pay off all this stuff? And how many churches the size even try to set out to get a church to get a sign of $15,000 or so? They would say, no, you can't do that to your bigger... Yeah, you can't. If you live in the natural, you're right. I don't plan on ever doing that or I will quit. Because it's a supernatural realm. The hour is late. And we've got to do everything in our power to reach the, reach the unsaved. Praying, soul winning, advertising, the internet, the, all of it. All of it. That's at our disposal to the best of our ability. Maybe I haven't been given a fur coat or a one carat diamond ring in a long time. But then how far do you go back to? I was given all of it back again for my own wedding set after I came up here. Maybe I'm not sitting out in the meetings out there. You know, I had a lady in, in uh, Randy Box Church. I'm embarrassed to say this, especially since we're online. But she came up to me and said, remember me? And I went, oh, help me, Jesus. <laughs> I get that so much. And I was just like, blank, help me, Jesus. And then she goes, I'm the one who gave you a one carat diamond. I thought, she goes, you remember that? And I thought, which one? Which time? Is it, is it one I'm wearing again today? I don't, you know, that we put in here that came back through. I don't know or if it was another one because I've given so many of them when they've come in. And she got up and told the story because she was just like, I'm sure it's the only one she's ever given. That's a big thing to give. But I've received many of them and I'm like, 
<laughs> you know, and I'm going, help me, Lord. Maybe that doesn't happen quite on the frequency it was happening, but other things. But if people are only looking for certain things, they think they don't even have any prosperity. I don't ever want to be one of those. If you want to start comparing, instead of comparing to where I was in Tampa, I'd like to compare to where I was in Alaska when this message came to me. I'm living in a dump and got to give that up to move in with other people. I don't have a, I have a total car. I have two beautiful vehicles sitting out here. I, I, I didn't have enough to go down the street and we still go places like Norway and Juneau, Alaska and anywhere God tells us to go and bring in preachers and they're all paid and they're, it's all, and have cameras and, and equipment and music equipment. It's all relative. But if people something, I don't ever get a diamond ring. I don't ever, I haven't been given a new car. What have you though? You've got to stop and remember his prosperity is still flowing. We have enough to get the job done. Maybe not as enough uh, as much as a big church, but we aren't in the position of the big church yet. We, we have enough to do what we're doing right now and we'll continue to grow. That is prosperity. It's never stopped. It's never stopped. And I've never, I've never, he can tell you, I've never, uh, maybe I've, gr not maybe, I have. And I've had to repent before the Lord griped about some other things, the way you're treated or whatever, but I've never one time said, I don't feel like we have very much or how can we, I've never felt that way. No. Maybe when you start out real broke, anything after that seems like a blessing. I mean, it's just, I'm like, bills are paid. I've got vehicles. I'm in a nice house. How much do I think I got to have before I have a lot? Yeah. I have a lot. But even if I didn't, can I leave you with this if you can't get any of the rest of it? I have a lot. But even if I didn't, what do we tell people who are sick in body? Wait till every symptom's done to say he heals? No. We say, you say right now, by his stripes I'm healed. Why do we do this different? Oh, I know prosperity is real and someday I'll, but right now I'm really struggling and, I, and then it flows for 30 minutes of what I don't have that I'd like to have or should have or what. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. I'm believing to have more than enough to do everything he's called us to do. But even if I didn't, I seriously am believing for that. So when I make this exclusion, it's not taken away from that. Even if he didn't, though, <laughs> it's the fact that it's his word. I'm going to say it with my last breath. It's the fact that he wants our hearts. He wants your heart. He wants nothing held back. He wants you to purpose. Maybe you can't do what the next person can do. Maybe you can't write out the $100,000 check. Maybe you can't do the carrot diamond ring. Maybe you can't give somebody a car. Whatever it is in any of these stories that you've heard. How do you get there, though? What neckties do I have? What piece of furniture do I have? What, and I'm, don't misunderstand me. I'm not, don't you dare go home and go, she said, I got to do something. I guess we better take a piece of it. No, you've got to hear from the Holy Ghost. You've always got to hear from the Holy Ghost. I'm only using examples because you've got to use something to stimulate people to start to think, oh, I do have things. I do. He says, let each one give. Not someday when he can, let each one give as he has purpose in his heart that I'm not going to stay here. God, I want to be free before you free to give and free to receive. I heard Brother Rodney say today that it was a little tougher on him receiving. I can't remember. I thought I'd remember this story, but he talked about something they were blessed with and he had a hard time receiving. And, and he said, God told him, you know, you got to learn to be a receiver too because a giver is going to have things come back. You know what? I remember too struggling for a few weeks. Oh, it's fun to give the testimonies how God led you to give something and you saw somebody's face light up and, and it met their need and they were so, oh, those are fun moments. But then when it started coming back, I'm like, should I keep anything? Should I? I could have kept that fur coat. I could have, I could have kept it. And, and, and I should have been able to wear it. I never have once, but understand that if I would have decided to keep it and wear it, I should be able to wear it anywhere without somebody going, who does she think she is? And there's one of those prosperity, pre that's not why I gave it. In fact, I'll just throw something in here too so you can get this side of the message. I'm not going to say who it was, but there's a rather well-known minister that 
the Holy Ghost led Brother Rodney to do something very extravagant for. And the man said, oh, I can't do that. I can't let you do that. What if the press found out? What if, what if? He goes, in other words, you're going to back down on something that you preach because it won't look good to the press? What if we start doing that on everything else we preach? In fact, that very man and another person, I won't mention either, both ministers, the press did attack them. And they started going, no, no, we're not prosperity. And Pastor Rodney called him and said, you're going to be in trouble with God to back down in this message. Who cares what they think? They don't walk in our shoes. They don't know when we didn't have anything and how we give and how. They don't know anything about it. They're going to attack you anyway. They will find something else to attack you about. If you back down and deny to the rest of the body of Christ that you believe that God will bless you, if you deny that, people are going to start going, oh, so-and-so now denies that message. And, and they, just because some have abused it. No, I will never, God help me if I ever deny the message that took me out of not having enough to go down the street and enabled me to take the love of Jesus and salvation into 35 nations. It was this message that did it. The truth here, that he would take care of me all the days of my life. That he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, my provider, as well as he is everything else. We can't ride on the message that you guys used to hear from me in revival how many years ago. We can't ride on me sharing something on the tithe once a year and one or two. It has to be real today. It has to be real today. I said a few weeks ago something my husband did that I just thought was over the top. I, or maybe, I don't even know. If I thought it was a little legalistic, I don't know what. But, but I remember him telling me years ago when I was an evangelist that if I get something for myself, I'm going to give it into God's work in equal portion, at least. And I thought, wow, that's a pretty strict rule. And I'm not asking everybody to abide by it, but I'm asking you to be open to the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost shed something in my heart there a few weeks ago. But again, when he speaks to your heart, how many know that's pretty difficult to vocalize? It's just that he says it really comes back. It's, it's not a legalistic thing. It's not a law thing, but it comes back to where's your heart at. After I get everything I want and after I pay off all my own bills and after I get all my toys and after I get the, the better house I want someday and the better... I, I, I'm going to do a lot of extra things like that too. We started out with the message in Haggai. How come we got pockets with holes in it? Because you've taken care of your own house before you've taken care of mine. But when we come back to the things of God first, he, he, he put it so simple to me years ago. I'll always let you have stuff as long as stuff doesn't have you. He never says it's money that's the root of all, all evil like the religious want to say. He says it's the love of it. You've got to have it if you're going to be a ministry. And if you don't believe that, just see how long you last without it. I'll make a challenge to anyone. Go out and try to do any of the things in the ministry. Try, try, yeah, Sonny's just finishing a book. Try to do that with no money. Try to, try to get on an airplane with no money. Try to get on TV with no money. Try to buy a Bible for somebody with no money. Try to have a crusade with no money. Try to buy a church building and the things that go in it with no money. And all the religious people that say you don't need it, then have at it. We'll see how many you win to the Lord without it. This is an important message that the enemy is wanting to keep hidden because as long as he can keep the church in one of two ditches, I'll either keep him, the religious church over here that says, Jesus was poor and so am I. And I'm proud of it because that makes me more like him. I don't ever want anything. We'll see how much that person does for the gospel. Or we'll take somebody to pervert the message over here and say, I'm believing God for my car, for my fancy car. I'm believing, you see that watch? God gave it to me. I'm believing God for my, there's nothing wrong with having a nice car, nothing wrong with having a, a private airplane. That's where people get the thing all messed up. They legalistically take the stuff. There's n n nothing wrong with that. If God tells somebody to, if it helps them be more 
uh, uh, get to a meeting quicker and not be tired when they're there and not have to waste time. I don't care if God tells somebody to get one. But then people start to get the idea that to be any kind of a preacher, my image is at stake unless I have the Rolex. That uh, God doesn't care if you have one. But if it's all that important to you for your image to have that, to have the private plane, to have the fancy home, you have perverted the message and are in danger of hell's fire. Because that will bring a person down. So it's about the purity of God. I love you. Everything I have is yours. The junky car, the nice car. <laughs> the little rented apartment, the beautiful home or anything in between. It's yours. It's not mine. I'm just a steward of it. The little church, the big church. A little television channel, a big one. Just help me to be a steward of it and help me to purpose in my own heart to give as you would have me to give and to mix faith with it. That, Lord, I give sacrificially where I'm at right now. That's what it means by he who sows a little or sows a lot. Let's say he's got two pennies to his whole name. And he puts those in the offering today. Let's say I have $100,000 in my savings account. That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And let's say besides that, I have in my purse today 1000 And I go, you know what? I bet you most people in this church today are only given 25 5 Maybe somebody will give 100 You know what I'm going to give today? 500, who has given a lot, him or me, by the stats I've just given you? He has, because he gave 100%. It's not talking about the amount, it's talking about how far we're stretched in what we give, the commitment we make in our heart. But if you go, yeah, I'm just gonna toss something in, and this is okay, that person's gonna reap like that. But the person that sacrificially goes, God, Everything I have belongs to you. That one reaps like that. And that's the Bible. That's not a preacher. I'm believing for this. I should, I should even hate. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to quit using the word little church. And when I use it, I'm using it in the context of stressing that I know how much you're given for this size. I know how much you're working for this size. I know where your commitment's at for this size, that nobody this size can have all that, do all that. That's what I'm trying to stress, that I recognize how miraculous that is for where we're at. But I don't want to keep using it because we're, we're, we have a big vision and we're going places. So I'm going to quit using that. But I started to say... I know what we've accomplished and I know what givers we already are. But oh, people, let's not back off. Let's not ever start doing something out of habit. I've watched people really stretch themselves and they were the first, couldn't wait to do this and couldn't wait to do that. And then over time, you're like, I never hear that from any of them anymore. Right? Or, uh, I mean, and just in general, the body of Christ, on the road, people, I know people, I talk to on the phone or sometimes in the church. And you're like, something's changing. Something's changing. The same touch we get in revival, fire, has to be there today. Amen. The same giving heart has to be there today. We, I can't ride on the giver I was in Tampa. I can't ride on the giver I was a year ago. I can't. It's got to be fresh today. Amen. The fire does. The, the revelation of the word does. The, the anointing has to be. I can't go, I remember what it was like to feel that anointing. Then it becomes, it's old. It's not fresh. God wants to do a new thing and a fresh thing. And this must come alive to us all over again. Amen. 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 <laughs> I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that a man of God came to Alaska I will be thankful all the days of my life. And I know some people think I, talk, I mention him too much and lift him up too much. And I'm no longer his associate evangelist, so I'm no longer, if people thought I did it to get pats on the back, <laughs> those days are long over. <laughs> I do it now because the Bible says to give honor where honor is due. And he was preaching at a time almost nobody was. 
And I was there when he had to face the religious devils to do it. And now I've been the one who's had to face many of them since then to do it. And I know the price a person pays for doing that. And I'm thankful that somebody paved the way and learned to give like that to come out of their hole instead of sitting over there in Africa saying, oh, I'll just always be a poor African preacher. I don't know why they just give me turnips and asparagus when other people have these great testimonies. It's so unfair. He came out of that and said, forgive me for whining and I will do what it takes. I will do what it takes. And I'm so thankful they paid the price. It made it easier for a lot of us to walk into behind him. Now I pray that we can pay it so others can walk into it for us in a new generation. A new generation. God is good all the time. I know we got people struggling here financially. I don't think I can think of one in here financially that probably is where they want to be. And if somebody says they're where they want to be, then I would have to say they were selfish, (laughs) that they don't want to be able to give more and have more to share with people. So none of us are where we want to be. But thank God we're not where we used to be way back, way back. And thank God we know the one who is Jehovah Jireh. And how does faith come? Yeah, by hearing and hearing, not having, oh, Debbie, you used to preach this message all the time, revival. We've already heard it. Go on to something we need. Oh, we don't need this anymore. We don't need this part anymore, huh? I'm just saying that because there's sometimes in the spirit you can catch little thoughts. I don't mean all the time, and I don't mean, (laughs) oh, just preach something we need. So what if everybody in here was well? And I started to teach about healing. Should I not anymore? Because... Oh, everybody's healed. We've heard that. As long as we have need in any area, and as long as it's the word of God, whether we have need or not, it bears repeating and repeating until it's fresh again. When I heard him teaching at, what was it, just a while back? The minister's conference. When we were listening on TV, uh, one of the services, he got going, and I, I sat there crying, going, That's just like I heard it the first time and it's coming like it did the first time. And I think others were going, I'll be glad when he's done with this and we can get into the real part of the service. And I'm going, oh yeah, this is the way I used to receive it. Yes, I need this. Yes. And you realize at those moments you're letting it slip. That's why it has to be right there. And see, they hear it like that by somebody morning and night, morning and night, morning and night. I heard him say today that he said he started adding up the television time that's been given to them free and how much that Brother Bob DeAndre told him that, the, that other people have to pay for it. And he started adding up times four hours that they were on every night. Anyway, it would be something like a hundred and some thousand dollars a service that was given to them free over, what, two or three years? But he said, now God has just spoken to me. (laughs) And I laughed when I heard him say it because I thought, yep, that's him. He just, when when God drops it in his heart, he just speaks it out to the church right then with no forethought. And that's probably why you hear me do that too, a lot like that. But he said, in fact, it just came to me and I'm just supposed to announce that it's time we start putting the Sunday morning services on the air all over the world. And he said, you know what that'll cost? And then he laughed. He said, I don't have the slightest idea how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it, church. And then you heard, you did, I didn't, now, of course, the cameras aren't scanning every person in that congregation. There were probably some that went. But for the most part, here's what you heard. <laughs> and that's what everybody did all the time and that stuff. You know why? It was kept there all the time. And we all, we all believed we could do anything. That's why us evangelists sitting here would go, I can't wait to get out next week. I can do anything. <laughs> and we can, church. We can. Anything he's called, any ministry he's called. I'm training ministers of the gospel in here. I don't just have a regular congregation, and I'm thankful for it. I got people who are called to preach and start ministries. You've got to get this part as well. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say I'll say, our God is a big God, a big God, a big God. And there is an anointing to give. Well, I was going to talk about the anointing on the prophet part two. We never finished the prophets part two and the apostle. Maybe we'll, I don't know tonight. We're just going to leave it up the Holy Ghost because there's unique anointings, corporate anointings that I want to get into as well. Um, and the healing anointing. So we'll see. But there is an anointing to give. 
and to go to another realm. I've been in it. I've given in it. I've preached where others have given in it, where it just fell like a, just, just like, <laughs> just like a river. Just if I can see that, I'm going somewhere. And it wasn't, you should always give with purpose, but it wasn't like that. It wasn't just purpose. It was, oh, this is a supernatural one and I'm getting involved in it. I'm believing we have some of those here as well. Amen. Amen. Well, with all that, we're going to receive both offerings, building God's house first in the tithe and offering. You know, for this one, I've just felt led that we come by and drop it in there. And um, we'll have Brother Gary receive the tithe first. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Did anybody get anything out of that? Huh? Good. If nothing else, you know what I used to say in the road? Bear with me. I got to preach it for me. I got to keep it right there for me. There are times I want to stop and amen myself. Ooh, that's good. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, that's where we're going. <laughs> Uh, let's go ahead and receive the tithe and offering. And then after Brother Gary is done receiving that, you can just come up here and, and give in this one. I'm going to pray ahead of time. Father, we thank you for these gifts we're about to receive in both offerings. We thank you that you've miraculously allowed us to do double payments and given us a plan to do this. But Lord, we believe even in the middle of the plan that the Holy Ghost can and shall do a mighty thing. And we still believe for a much earlier payoff even than that. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for a faithful people. But, Lord, let them not only be faithful. I'm so thankful for that. But let them also be expectant. Let them also see with eyes to see what you want to do for them and where you want to take them. And, Lord, we thank you that we shall reap bountifully so that we have even more to give into your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do we have a plan for the offering? I'm sure everybody's going, what do we do now? <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and play something. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For any need in this house, he is awesome. Is there anyone this morning that you'd say, I'm going to come up and I'm going to have hands laid on for whatever the need is, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether it's for strength, whether it's uh, a relationship problem, whatever it is, you say, no, I'm coming up today and I'm just believing for that in Jesus' name. Anyone? Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> 